Good afternoon, ladies and gentlemen, honorable resource person, our speaker today, our special lecturer today, Professor Jessica Rawson, honorable moderator, Professor Stephen McKinnon. Thank you and welcome. Participants, we are extremely delighted to have you here. I'm Saka Kotamara and I will be your MC for this special session. Welcome to the Tang Prize Lecture of AAS in Asia Conference 2024 by Professor Jessica Rosen. Today, July the 11th, 2024, allow me to extend our grateful feelings that we all can gather here to listen a lecture and discuss very important things about China's great themes and the treasures they have revealed. This event is conducted hybrid we, here we have more than 30 persons joining this program. Please give a big applause to all of us this afternoon. Thank you so very much. And around us, participants from online meeting, we would like to welcome everyone from online participants. We also inform you that our special season is live streaming via Universitas Gajah Mada YouTube channel, and this program will be recorded in Zoom meeting. This special session is supported by the Tang Prize Foundation. Let me inform you about Tang Prize. Rooted in China's time-honored philosophical tradition and convergence of different civilization, the Tang Prize was established in 2012 to recognize outstanding individuals or organizations who have made significant contributions to sustainable development, biopharmaceutical science, sinology, and the rule of law. Laureates are selected biennially by independent committees of internationally renowned experts and scholars, including Nobel laureates regardless of ethnicity, nationality, or gender. Each award carries a cash prize of 50 million New Taiwan dollars, approximately 1.7 million US dollars, with 10 million New Taiwan dollars, approximately 0 0.35 million US dollars, designated as a research grant to foster further innovation and positive societal impact. Ladies and gentlemen, now we will have a lecture from our resource person. The lecture will be led by moderator, but before that, let me read a short profile of our moderator. Stephen McKinnon, he's an emeritus professor at Department of History, College of Liberal Arts and Sciences. Besides a professor, he is a former director of Center for Asian Studies at Arizona State University. He is also an author. He has published his academic articles and book chapters, the new one in 2023, titled Chen Hansheng, China's Less Romantic Revolutionary. He also got many research grants over the years. The professor has given numerous domestic and international papers relating to Chen. He's an expert for the Chinese Academy of Social Sciences in Beijing. He's a life member of the Association of Asian Studies. He has so many experiences, ladies and gentlemen. Now, without further ado, please welcome our moderator, Professor Stephen McKinnon. We hand over to you for introducing the speaker, lead the presentation and question and answer session, please. Hello, yeah, I think it's working. <clears throat> well, it's, it's my honor uh, and privilege to introduce uh, our, our, our speaker, 
Jessica Rawson. Uh, and I'm going to be brief. She's a, a scholar of great uh, achievements, but also a practitioner in a variety of ways uh, in an, uh, academia, but also in a more practical sense. Uh, it, her career is quite remarkable. Uh, she is uh, from the UK, as you probably know, <coughs> born in London, uh, educated at Cambridge, University of London. She also went to St. Paul's Girls School, uh, a very important place uh, in London. Uh, and uh, she is currently a professor of Chinese art and archaeology at Oxford. Uh, before that, uh, she was 28 years uh, uh, with the British Museum uh, in a whole variety of capacities, a lot of it in the sinological realm, but also in a practical realm of ministry and so on. And I believe I, uh, that this is one of the reasons that when she went to Oxford, uh, she immediately went into administration, partially anyway, uh, and was the first female warden of Merton College from 1994 to 2010. And then a uh, pro-vice uh, chancellor at Oxford for 2006 to 2010. So her talents in that direction, besides her prodigious uh, scholarly output, which we're going to hear about uh, a, a great deal uh, uh, today, uh, she also promoted uh, China and inner Asian work on the material culture of, of, that, of that region uh, for years. She's really an archaeologist and a professor of art. Uh, a very interesting uh, combination. She's worked a lot on the Mongolian steppe, South, uh, South Siberia, North China, and so forth. Uh, and we'll hear more, I think, about that uh, today. Uh, for me, who's somebody who has studied more contemporary China or more modern China, I write books about the 20th century Chinese history. Uh, she's also, when she was at Oxford, she was very helpful in promoting and helping to raise money and so on uh, to develop uh, the Oxford University China Center, which I myself uh, have visited, uh, far afield from her own field in a sense. Uh, Anyway, her, her, I could go on uh, about uh, recognition, uh, uh, titles and uh, medals and prizes and uh, uh, so on and so forth, but I think I'll stop uh, and just uh, present to you, <coughs> excuse me, uh, Professor uh, uh, Rawson. Uh, really, it is a remarkable career. Uh, and she is going to be talking, in a way, about this, this book. Uh, it's at least part of, of what she's talking about today, I think. Uh, this just came out last year, uh, uh, about tombs. It has a wonderful title, Life and Afterlife in Ancient China. So I give you Professor Ross. <laughs> well, can you hear me? Is the microphone working? Ah, yes. Um, so, actually, I am going to talk about the afterlife, and possibly the subtext is to say that China has a very complicated set of religious beliefs, of which this is the most prominent. How do people live after death? But it's embedded in a much more complicated um, scenario, if you like, of ideas about the cosmos. They add Buddhism and Taoism. But those of, since the majority of audience are, in fact, Chinese, you all know that already. Whereas if we had a, an audience that included people who study India or Indonesia or Britain, they would be very surprised at what I'm going to say. Um, so the subtext is that. But I'm also going to show in the way in which these tombs, which provide the afterlife for great 
figures and for minor people, are full of objects, and those are the objects we see in museums. We go to the museums and we take them for granted. We believe that everything we see was used where? We don't ask ourselves that question. They are mainly found in tombs, but they're very often made for life. And that the ones we see in museums are made for kings, for aristocrats, and a whole variety of high-ranking individuals. So, in fact, one of the things I've followed is what do these objects in a group tell us about their owners? So I shall do quite a lot of that, but I think what is most important and what nobody in the West really realizes is that this is a very important, if you like, belief about the afterlife, about life after death, and how Chinese actually see the organization of society living and dead, and they see it in a very intense hierarchy. So um, those of you who know China, of course you all know China, you will all know this intense hierarchy. I've got, you've got an echo of me, is that right? Is that, you get, you're getting two Jessicas, are you? Um, but perhaps the technician could reorganize so that we only get one voice. Otherwise, I can't speak. I don't want to speak and hear myself again. <laughs> um, there seems to be a technical problem. Um, so the map, in my view, is very important. And um, I don't know if this provides me with a pointer. I guess it does. This is China's hinterland. China is here, as you all know. But in fact, what nobody ever mentions is that this is China's hinterland. And today, it is part of China. But it has taken them centuries or millennia to take this over. But in fact, if you live here, you can't help but interact with these people in the Gobi, in Xinjiang, and in Tibet. And this um, has become, this large area is now going as far as the Altai and to the south edge of Mongolia. This large area is now part of the PLC. Um, but um, in the early period, we're talking about this area. This is the agricultural plain. And here is a very important area we're going to talk about, which is where the Huangtu is, where the yellow earth is. And without the yellow earth, you wouldn't have these tombs. I'm going to introduce the ones you know immediately. And I want you to try to tell yourselves what you see. Do you see tomb figures? Do you see clay figures? Or do you see a real army? Wh what do you see? And in fact, um, everybody just sees clay figures. But they're not clay figures. They are, in fact, the army for the afterlife. They're there to defend the emperor in the afterlife. And until you can get your mind around that double movement, if you like, in life, they're for the tourists to see the clay figures. But actually, they were made in order to provide an army for the afterlife. And it's this mixing of two systems in one that is actually typical of a lot of China. Um, when you put peonies on the wall or look at images of dragons, they're both an image and they are also the dragon or the peony. And they function as auspicious images, if you like, or auspicious um, beings. You, so. And the thing about Chinese is it's a very efficient language. They don't need to say it's an image. They just say it's a peony or this is a soldier. And so, especially in classical Chinese, there, that question of what they are is completely omitted. Here you see them in detail. And the most important thing is the detail that they have gone to enormous lengths to make sure they look exactly like a real army. And I think that is absolutely key to how they function. And also quite important to me are the horses. This is the horse from the pits, but it's exactly like this one, which is from Kazakhstan and found in a tomb in Kazakhstan. And in fact, the Western, the Qin state is a Western state with very strong links to the Northwest. So, and you see this in these cheek pieces these are cheek pieces. This is from inside China. This is from Pazarik, that's in Siberia. And this is from Kazakhstan. 
So the Kazakhstan model has been adopted in Siberia and in the borders of China. And so we're in a late phase when the Chin, with our Western contacts, is bringing in contact and ideas from further west. And that is one of my interests, but it's um, not absolutely fundamental, except to say what the tomb is telling us is that the emperor's capacities and interests and control is enormous, including as far west as the borders of Kazakhstan. And there are these splendid birds near his tomb, and the tomb is in fact being provided with all the features you need in the court, so that um, they are there not for daily life, they're not a monument. If they were in the west, we'd say this was a monument, like Borobudur, but not. This is an actual palace for the afterlife. And until we get our minds around that, we'll find China quite hard. Here is a tomb, and this is where tombs start to be really interesting. Here is the, uh, this is not excavated, it's been examined by remote sensing, by a form of echo and radar, and it is very deep. It is 35 meters deep, and it has a fur further false grave shaft, if you like. That's the grave shaft here. Um, this is in profile, uh, cut through the section, and it's again 30 meters. So this is an enormous ed edifice, about 60 meters high, 20 stories of a building. So what is never discussed, and this is why I've written about it in such detail in my book, is the objects we see in museums were used and made for tombs, and we're going to look at why they're so deep. They're deep, amazingly deep. No one in any other part of the world would start digging a tomb 30 meters below ground level and then adding a bit of decoration above it. It's engineering-wise quite extraordinary. So um, I, I thought I'd show you some more objects before we get to the real tombs. And here is a Han Dynasty tomb. This is the main tomb, M1. And um, it's in Nanjing, near, near the Yangtze River. Um, and we're in the Han Dynasty now. We've moved from the Qin into a more ebullient period. Um, here, this is going into the tomb. And it's a very carefully compartmented tomb here. And you can see it's built like a house like the main coffin is there and then a series of little chambers or rooms with objects in them and the objects are hugely varied so like many tombs they have ritual vessels and actually very high fired ceramic um, they have a set of bells that would go with the ritual vessels um, and then this is quite extraordinary the, obviously the ruler of this small Han dynasty state liked the idea of exotic animals the elephant with his keeper, the rhino with a very tough keeper, and lots and lots of tigers are in this tomb. Quite extraordinary. And then, what's more, their contacts with the West. This is a silver bowl that could come from Parthia, from Iran. Here we have a step figure, a stag deer, that is holding a lamp. And the lamp is much more like a Roman item than like a Chinese. And here we have actually an imitation of a steppe belt plaque with a dragon and tortoises, which are motifs from China, but used for a belt. And of course, belts are not a Chinese thing. So let's go to, so I, those are samples of what comes out of a tomb and what we, why we need to think about what kind of agency do these objects have? How do they, what, who are they aimed at? Who are they influencing? Who made the choice? And how should we see them? What agency do they have on us? Well, from my perspective, they're telling me uh, quite a lot about the period and the time and what the man or woman chose or his family or her family chose. But um, I think we also have to think, why are they there in such a lavish and high quality material and what does it mean to be want to be buried with all this? What intrigues me about Chinese tombs is they're so large. And this is at the beginning of the series of large tombs. This is a Shang Dynasty tomb, 
of about 1200 BC, and it's enormous by anything in the West or in any other country of the world. Um, it's 14 or 15 meters deep, and you can see there are people, and it's cut straight down, but it's cut straight down into the Huangtu, into the Lois, and nowhere else in the world is there a soil that would allow you to do that. If you were digging in England, it would have fallen in after one meter or two meters. In America also, in India also. Anywhere that is humid would be, be hopeless. This is in a northern part of China, and the material is loess, and that is a wind-blown, sandy material, but it's actually not sand. If it was sand, it would be ro rolled through waves in the sea, and it would be rounded. These are not rounded crumbs, these are flat bits of rock, and they pack together to form a stable side. And this is an area I'm still trying to learn more about from the geologists in China. No archaeologist in China has ever written about this. There's one article about cave houses, but basically the archaeologists leave this to the geologists, and the geologists, it turns out, didn't know it was so important to the history of Chinese culture. I put the bronzes next to them, because in, these are from the British Museum, just to indicate that these bronzes come out of a tomb like this. In fact, they're not as grand as this royal tomb at Anyang, but um, they are definitely used for life. But like the other objects I've shown you, they have a role in the afterlife. And it's that that I think we need to take away when we go to a museum. We need to see the objects as having a role in the afterlife. So what is Lois? Here it is. It's all over northern China, but it's unique to China. It runs from here, this is beyond Lanzhou, and it runs here to the Taihang Mountains. And at this area, it's about 200 meters deep, and then it scatters up to the north. I've seen it here in Liaoning and Jilin, and here you find it distributed over parts of the south. But the only really functioning bit for strong tombs is this part, and I don't think the people who started to dig here uh, when they made first made, um, wells, and then they made houses in it. They didn't realize it was so exceptional, they just thought it was useful. Uh, but having found it was useful, they went further. So this is what it looks like. This is just a typical site in part of northern China. In the, in, they call this the Huangtu Gaoyuan, the lowest plateau. It's an absolutely central part of China, and without it, China wouldn't be China. The thing that's been omitted is you wouldn't have tombs, you wouldn't have walls, you wouldn't have platforms with wooden buildings on it. None of it would exist without this. And this is, as you see, it's naturally very stable, but if you pound it, as the Chinese did, it makes very strong walls, houses, and I mean, many of you will have seen these lowest houses, but also if you go to the Forbidden City or any of these large temples to they're on platforms and the original platforms are made of lois nowadays they may also be other materials but they're not made of stone and if you were looking at temples in the mediterranean area the platforms would be of stone and if you go to borobudur the whole structure is of stone but this this is not what china did so here we here you show some examples of how stable it is um, this is just a cutting through the landscape, and you get a straight side totally easily. And the sta stability is, shows, because this is heavily eroded, but it's still standing up in kind of artificial columns. So it's a highly stable material, and it's very rare that um, any other part of the world, where there is Lois in Germany, there is Lois in America, but it's not in this large quantity, and it's not... It hasn't been exploited to this degree. The Chinese discovered this around 2500, really, and they went on using it down till, till the 20th century. I mean, I've seen, now it might not be much use, but I've seen many villages in the Xi'an area built of Lois, and um, they were, the walls, the houses, everything is made of Lois. So it, it was a highly 
functional material that has been replaced not probably not by better materials and so if you look at this tomb that I showed you this is what it looks like in section and here we're looking at a tomb that is four stories in depth so um, this again shows you how remarkable this tradition is and it's just not found anywhere else and once they've started um, I'm now view culture including manufactured tombs or monuments as like an, something that's passed from hand to hand like in a contagion in a disease so the question I've put to my archaeological friends working in the Mediterranean is why does the whole of Europe use stone architecture and then when they colonize America they transport it to America or to Australia and one reason may be because there's a lot of stone but I think it's more that there are one or two major objects to look at and that is Egypt followed by the big temples in Greece and then Rome and once Rome collapses there's a lot of stuff to be looted and so we build our churches out of stuff looted from Roman buildings so something has brought wooden building of stone buildings all over Europe now I think what I would say is the same thing has happened here the northern Chinese could and did build deep tombs once that was known people tried to copy them in other parts of China they did not have such good material and so in southern China you find instead of going vertically down they go down in a long slope and it's less perilous because the water is damper earth but this tradition is now so strongly established it goes on to the Qing dynasty as you know the Ming tombs the Qing tombs are the late descendants of the Shang dynasty tombs so I'm going to hop through some time this is what happens in the 8th and 9th, 9th and 8th century as the big attempt to form a single state splits into smaller states and here sorry I want to go back here you see a late an Eastern a sort of early Eastern Joe late Western Joe so 8th century tomb still in the lowest and it's 13 meters deep and that's the, what it looked like when I visited it and it gives you vertigo to look into it it is extremely worrying to look down at these vertical sides now he's a very good member of the Joe clan of he's a proper aristocrat of the ruling house so he has nice bronzes these are his bronzes but these are of his first most senior wife these are of the secondary wife and these are of his son they come from their different tombs and this is a time when um, the, the bronze is all in this rather uniform form style so having said that he's well behaved he's a member of the ruling class we then look at what he owns he owns this now I've just said that there's Lois over everything and there's no gold in that part so the lowest has several amazing impacts it prevents the stone being visible so people don't set off using stone they set off using Huangtu the yellow earth but also there's no bronze no copper visible there's no bronze it has to be introduced from the West I'm not going to describe how that happens but it comes quite early there's definitely no gold and so any gold you see like this and this is a man with multiple gold belts here these are gold belts this is a scabbard for a jade's um, dagger and these are thumb rings this is equipment for a step lord because um, though he may have worn this is a reconstruction done by the, the excavators this is in uh, at Reigwar in Yang Dai Sun near Hancheng but here he's wearing a robe so actually at that stage people didn't wear belts belts are a step thing for people wearing tunics and trousers or leggings so this guy is an unusual guy he's got he's very well behaved he's got all the right ritual vessels but he's got good contacts with someone outside the area of the Jew, of the big royal clan so I think that's the thing I take away often from these tombs is you learn quite a lot about the individual and their international relations if you like also here 
he has knives with iron blades. And this, in, say, 750 BC, is the earliest use of iron excavated from a, a, a datable tomb. So that uh, iron is not indigenous, the manufacture of iron is not indigenous to China. It's definitely from the steppe or from Central Asia. A lot of this could come from Xinjiang, but um, it gets introduced and then it becomes one of China's big triumphs. Um, I'm going to show you now an uh, Eastern Zhou tomb. This is the, a very famous one, one of the most famous. This is the tomb of the Marquis Yi of Zheng, and he has a gold cup. Now, the gold cup again shows you that he has his own contacts. He makes contacts with people who can supply enough gold. There's no gold in central China. It could come from Sichuan province, but it's also likely to come from further north. And he's done here. This is, um, this is his copper mine. And the Zheng state is a subordinate state at this state, 443 BC, he, of the state of Chu. So we're in the southern China. This is much wetter. But, and he's built a large tomb that's actually sitting on rock. So he's trying to get quite a lot of stability in a region where stability is a little hard to get. So he's, not, he's, he's very ambitious and he's got an enormous quantity of bronze. Here is a doll's house version. Here I'm hearing my echo again. Um, a doll's house version. This is the, the drawing of the tomb. This is the photo of the tomb as it was excavated. And here you have the central chamber with a bell set. I'm going to show you that in detail. And he has a private room with his own coffin, which is that. And here are a group of ladies buried with him and an armory. And now the question of burying people with the main person is in fact only to be understood as accompanying him as attendants in the afterlife. If you don't understand these tombs as providing a palace for the afterlife, the whole thing becomes hard to understand. Why put all this stuff at such high quality and very high value in a tomb unless it's to be used? So this is his coffin. And like the tomb, the pottery figures, this uh, is not an ar arbitrary drawing. It is providing a door. This is a door for the Marcus to come out of his coffin. Here is a window. And here on the coffin, these are blown up details, are images of uh, people, of, of omens, of spiritual figures who must be protective. They would never put on this coffin things that were not protective of the, uh, of the Marquis. And here you see they're carrying halberds. So they're actually literally armed. So what we're seeing is this movement in and out of objects that are used in daily life and objects that are images or replicas or pictures. And this is a very important feature in all Chinese belief, that the image is as important as the thing of which it is an image. I don't want to say the real thing, because I don't want to use the word real. The images are as real as the spirits they're depicting. And here you see um, a large number of vessels. This is a man with an enormous wealth. These are very large, as you see with one of my former students standing next to these two Hu vessels. Here they are in reality. Um, they are probably, you know, at least two thirds of her height. And he has a whole set of ordinary Gui and Ding, but he has very fancy vessels. And you can see that the tomb was probably flooded and filled up with sand after it was built. So that's why it's actually very well preserved. And here is the bell set. And this is one of the most important discoveries in China. Um, it's, there are 65 bells, all tuned with two notes and still being played or could be played. And they would, you can see their size relative to the people excavating or standing there with the sticks or mallets which have been used to play them. They are, in fact, in English, we would call them a gong. They don't have a clapper. They don't ring. They have to be hit to produce the notes. 
And um, this is an incredibly important set. It's never left China. It's never been exhibited overseas at all. But I do recommend seeing it. It's in Hubei in the Provincial Museum. And it's one of the great discoveries of not only of archaeology and of the afterlife, but of musicology. And it's a very important find. And this is the last slide here. We see that this man is prepared to fight. He has armor suits for the horses and men, and he has a tent. And it's clear that he intended to travel with sets of lacquer cups and bowls and vessels of wine. And here we have the bronze fittings that would have made a tent like this. And it's possible that this is for pleasure journeying, but it might be for fighting or for control of the land which he ruled. But it's the first time that such an elaborate piece of, if you like, small-scale engineering has come to light. And this, uh, this tomb has particularly strong connections with very complicated bronze fittings. So I, I would actually suggest that um, we, we see different things in different places. So the earlier guy with his gold belt has got strong contacts to the north. This man has a very wide range of people who work for him, and among them are very skillful engineers. So that different people had different control, different links, and that's one of the things you learn from the tombs. But at the same time, you have to bear in mind that they're doing this for the afterlife, that they are not thinking of us, we're not the, the audience for this, and the audience is first the family who buries him, but is later the spirits of the afterlife, the world of the afterlife. And we have to think about that in much more detail than Westerners have been prepared to think. I believe Chinese have thought about it all the time, but nobody in the West ever thinks about it because we think of the revealed religions only, Taoism or Buddhism. We might call this Confucianism, we might, but it, I mean, it's much more elaborate than that. Um, so, um, if we go further south, um, or no, further north, I mean, here, we see the next step. The next step are a group of people who are moving in from the north. They may not come from very far away, but they are definitely doing some funny things. What is sh it is showing us is that as China is developing, so is Mongolia, and in it are people riding horses. And some of them are pushing their friends, if you like, into what we today regard as northern China. And um, they're certainly behaving a bit as if they were Chinese, but so they might make a nice, neat tomb with a coffin center, but also with attendants, but its line is covered in stone. And that is a, a totally step feature that they've picked up from further north and brought into northern China. Um, burying the person with animal heads is also not polite in China. You would never do that in a formal tomb. Also, you wouldn't wear gold earrings. And your bronze casting, this is a dreadful piece of casting, and this is obviously locally made for the owners of the tomb. But meanwhile, he's also acquired bronzes that have been made by someone else. So again, the contents tell you quite a lot about the person and telling us that China is much more diverse than we expected. And that diversity feeds into the big states which are there before the first emperor conquers them. So here, we have the Qi state. This is in Shandong province. And by this time, they've adopted mounds. And mounds are definitely a feature of the north and seem to have been introduced down the east coast first and then moved into central China. And here are the, the rulers of the Qi in their mounded tombs. And they have also very carefully arranged attendants. And they also show some interest in stone. So the Qi state is definitely engaged with the people in the north, but they're definitely not northerners. But they do like horses. So what has happened is the pressure of the people with the horses and riding horses has meant that the Chinese states have to pick that up as well, and they must be ready and prepared to fight in the afterlife with their horses. 
Here you can see that they're quite conventional. These are all ceramic, but they're typical vessels of the ritual performance for the ancestors. So um, I've been showing you quite deliberately that people have different relationships with what is happening around them, but it's certainly not one single line of development. There are definitely regional developments and different levels of engagement with outside. And the same is true of the Qin state. Here we are in the ancestor of the first emperor, and he has a very elaborate tomb also. It's a sixth century tomb, and this one is 20 meters deep. And I have seen this, and it's a nightmare to look at. It's so um, vertiginous. You stand up here, and you're looking down 20 meters. Um, and these are his attendants arranged very neatly around the main living area of the duke. The tomb is completely robbed, but some aspects of it have turned up in another tomb, so we know that he had very beautiful gold objects showing his links probably with the steppe, and he also had a large group of horses buried near the tomb. So we're in an age of horses, we're in an age when the afterlife, as much as life, requires horses, and um, this, he carries over this into his, um, his follow his later dukes. And this is, these are all at Yongcheng. This is a large cemetery of the Qi state before the first emperor, before indeed the first emperor and his father and grandfather. This is early Qi, but, and it's near Baoji, not so near Xi'an. So that brings us back to the first emperor. And the first emperor's tomb cannot be contemplated without the several things that I've mentioned. The first is that he's got the capacity to build a very deep tomb because of the geology of the area and because he's inherited, he didn't start this, he inherited a long tradition. And what is interesting, and we underestimate, how strong traditions may last centuries or more. So the, the first emperor has inherited this tip tradition. He's also inherited the idea that the image, the clay soldier, is as valuable as the real soldier, or what I might call the killed, the sacri not sacrifice, the killed living soldier. So, and again, as I said about the horses, he has this contact with the Northwest. So I haven't argued much or discussed much about the Northwest, but China has only one way in, and that is through the North and therefore its main international relations are with the North, and that is the horse owners. Um, in later times, of course, there are relations by sea. But the huge height of Tibet means relations directly across Tibet are is not possible because you cannot walk across Tibet. You have to be adjusted to the climate or to the height. So um, the North is the main relationship of central China from the beginning until, you know, as the first horses and the first animals arrived in 2500, down to the about 1000 AD when the sea becomes pretty important. So here is the tomb we looked at. And if we think, I'm now going to show you a bit more about why I think we should take this seriously, that this is the afterlife. So, I was intrigued when I first went to Xuzhou, Xuzhou in eastern China, in Jiangsu province. These are the tombs dug in horizontally into little mountains for the princes, the imperial princes of the Han dynasty, the Western Han. And I was absolutely staggered to discover, oh, sorry. I was staggered to discover the toilet. But these tombs quite normally have toilets and if they have met the ruler and his spouse, they have two toilets. And the toilet consists, as the local um, village toilet would have done when I went first to China, with a hole in, in the ground. And um, many of you will be totally familiar with this. So this is a complicated tomb, and all these tombs in Xuzhou are very complex, with many rooms for different functions, but definitely they're intended for living in. Now, if you actually 
meet the documents that are sometimes found in these tombs, they get, take you much further. They are a sign that in the Western Han Dynasty, the people have, dis have created to understand what happens in the future and a bureaucracy of the afterlife. So they will give the sender's identity, they will give the deceased's identity and the intended recipient and then they will list the grave goods. So here we come to the grave goods. And I've given both an English and a Chinese version, but they are actually quite detailed. And the reason I think it's important is that they give you the servants A and servant B, but when you see the tomb, the tomb actually has tomb figures, not real people, not sacrificed or killed people. So we're looking at a stage when the Han Dynasty is completely concerned with the bureaucracy of the afterlife, but that can be met with, and this is an important semi-legal document, it can be met with the pottery figures or wooden figures, which you know are extremely common in Han Dynasty tombs. So we've seen, if, if you like, a very long trajectory from the Shang to Han, where they're moving from tombs in which they would bury attendants, they'll bury bronzes, they'll bury ceramics and jades and lacquer, and I showed you bells and gold, all these things. But now we've got to the Han Dynasty and we got to a much more routine way of organizing funerals and organizing death. And this is a story that actually I picked up when my students were being taught by Glenn Dubridge in Oxford. And um, he was very keen on the Taiping Guangji, and they all had to read and translate his classical stories. And this one is, a, is an important one. It was a traveler is going along, and he meets a ghost who tells him that he's having trouble with the, the people fighting in a tomb. And would this guy come and help? So he's, he comes before the tomb, and he pronounces an order of execution. And as he does this, he hears the execution. And the grateful ghost comes out with beheaded tomb figures to show that it's taken place. So this is put up in the, in the text in this rather shortened form, but I've also heard it described in a more elaborate form. But this is the Tang Dynasty. We're now in the 8th, 9th century. We've moved on a long way, but it, it is a clear indication that these ideas about the afterlife are continuing on and feeding the tomb manufacture, if you like. And this is not a ruler's tomb that's being described. It's some local elite, probably, in, in the middle of the town. To end with, I'm going to show you these much later examples, because here we have, on the left, the area of the Tang royal tombs, and on your right, the Ming Dynasty, with their tombs in, which you've all, many of you will have visited here, along the mountain, foot of the mountain, it's a bit exaggerated, and the long avenue of animals leading to these tombs. But we learn very much the same thing. So here we have the Wanli tomb at the Dingling. This is the only imperial tomb that has been excavated since the since 1949, it was excavated in the 50s and it's regarded as not a successful excavation, but it is still open and can be visited, or at least I visited and I'm sure some of you have. Um, so it's not in a very good area for digging tombs. I understand from one of my colleagues who's reading texts about digging this tomb in the Ming Dynasty that they were troubled with leak leaking so they've, they've lined it with stone, which is something you don't see in one of these early tombs in the lowest plateau. But it's way down, it's 11 meters down at least, and you come in through a corridor, and then left and right are chambers for the emperor and the empresses, or empress and subordinate wives. So um, it reminds one a bit of these Han Dynasty tombs, though the Western Han tombs are really much more complicated. And what has intrigued me all the time is that there's 300 rolls of textile. And 
The burial and the funeral did not require 300 rolls of textile. They're required for the future. And if you look at them, if you see them, these, this is a drawing from the report. Here you see a, a rolled up textile in which the sections needed for the dress, for the court dress, are laid out but not cut out. So um, this is a very important sign that the anticipation is that they would be there in the future, in the afterlife, to be cut out and worn. And I think it's a very significant that this is, it just happens to be the one Ming tomb that's excavated, but I'm sure many other tombs are like that. So what I'm really suggesting is that we should look at the tombs of China as one of the most important series, if you like to call them monuments, but of the most important expressions of Chinese belief and activity. And when I talk about agency, I think you need to think they are not making the bronzes for us to admire in the museum. They're not making them to admire at the funeral. They're making them to be used in some sort of future. And therefore, um, I would say we must at all times take the notion of the ancestors and the life after death extremely seriously. And this is something that is rarely considered by Western historians. And in my experience now in talking to Chinese colleagues and Chinese students that I've taught, as every family today treats the life of the family as a private event, not something that is widely shared. And there's not a lot of discussion, even today, about attitudes to funerals or performance of funerals in different parts of China. And it's sure, I'm absolutely sure, that there's lots of different ways that they happen, different levels of belief, different practices, in, because China's an enormous country and they will not all be the same. And I'm not in a position, and I never will be in a position, to find out what is happening all over China. But what I'm now convinced about is that this is a belief system that is of profound importance to China from the late Neolithic to today, with deviations and perhaps periods when it declined or wasn't so important when some aspects of Buddhism may have overtaken. But um, I don't think we should ever forget that the ancestors are always present and that the hierarchy of generations is of overwhelming importance. Um, instead of talking about China as being authoritarian, I would say it was extremely hierarchical at all levels, at family level, at regional levels and at the state level, and that the model is carried right through. And the reason this is important today is that in the West, we are working on a different social system. We are descendants of people of, who are profound Christians and worked with the idea of a non-kin community. So we have family priorities and communities. China has family priorities and communities. But I think in the Far East, and this includes Japan and Korea, the balance is different from in the West. And that is one reason we don't understand each other very well. And we, our vocabularies are not up to it, are not adequate. So the meaning of the word community in English is not very well translated into Chinese. And so all the things that I think are important in a community are very little understood in China. And why should they be? And all the things that are important in a family in China are not understood in the West. So uh, this is the subtext of what I've been writing about. Um, but I don't think one can look at any of these tools without taking them extremely seriously as a attempt, as an offer, to provide for the person the, the suitable afterlife. And in doing so, telling us the, something about the life of that man or woman in, as he lived, and where he lived and what he owned. And so that much of my work has been on that point entirely. Um, I have, however, come to see that we need to take the hierarchy of China as a way of understanding China much more profoundly. 
than I had thought about when I first joined the British Museum in the 1960s. In the 1960s, one couldn't go to China, one couldn't buy a book. So much has changed, and I have deliberately traveled widely, because I think without traveling widely, you can't see how different all these regions are. They are all extremely different, and anything I've said might not apply to one that you happen to know. I have no idea what is the overall variety that one might expect to see in China overall in tomb practice from all periods, from the Neolithic to the Qing at least, and probably to today, but certainly down to the big Qing tombs near Beijing. So that's why I look at the tombs, and I think um, when I've had more time with the geologists in China, I will understand better why you can build these extraordinary tombs, because I think what has really been left out of the story is that the geology makes it possible. Once the geology has made it possible, then many things follow. But it starts in some ways with the geology of the Huangtu Gaoyuan. Thank you. I guess uh, we're now going to proceed uh, to uh, uh, questions and, and discussion. Uh, questions for Professor Rawson uh, or comments on, uh, she's covered a lot of a huge range of subjects in a way in terms of the tombs uh, so uh, and periods of time as well all the way to one league later and so on uh, so uh, are, are there some uh, questions or thoughts uh, that anybody would like to ask. I see, I see somebody raising their hand yes, right now. Right. I have a, a very ignorant question about the horses. Oh, yeah. Cool. Are they, are they, were they living horses or are they statues of horses? And when there was a trench and your, your slide they said, were, were note the horses, I didn't see any horses. They um, undoubtedly were real horses in those trenches. Um, and the reason the horses are important is that China is not a good area to breed horses. It is too hot and too humid, and it lacks certain nutrients. That's another thing I'm pursuing, but it lacks selenium and possibly other things. So that you can breed horses, of course, in China, and they are bred in China at all periods, but in order to fight the people who own northern horses, you have to get new ones from those very people. So China's in constant negotiation with the Mongol area. And it's certainly the case that they did have to do it. Uh, we aren't completely clear why, the, which part of the north is causing this problem, but it's, uh, there's a big area which causes human disease called the Kashin Bak disease from southern Tibet through central areas, you know, through the area where the Shang and Zhou were, right up to Heilongjiang. There's a long area which is between the cool area and the very hot area. The very hot area doesn't come into discussion because the horses would not flourish there anyway in the humid south. Um, and you don't see them on the street here, after all. But um, in the north, you can, you, they should flourish. But I suspect we need to find out more about the Huangtu, about the Lois again. Whether that is beneficial or not beneficial, it seems to me this is only just slowly getting onto the agenda, and mainly because it causes human disease, and that that's now very well known and the Chinese government put um, selenium into certain products like salt. And in fact, if you go into a pharmacy in England, a you know, health, health center, you can buy pills with selenium in it. So it's obviously something we need, though not in large quantities. Uh, thank you very much, Professor, for a very, very interesting presentation. Uh, I'm not, you know, uh, into archaeology or stuff like that, but I'm really interested. Um, I, I, I noticed that you have a wooden uh, coffin just now for the marquee. 
uh, uh, in, in your presentation just now, you showed a wooden coffin. Yes. Yeah, yeah. And I noticed that, I, I don't know, from my angle, it appears to be quite short. Of the coffin is quite short, and I'm just wondering if uh, does that actually you know uh, tells us uh, you know uh, how tall or how short uh, you know uh, people who live in that era are, and uh, could that also throw insights into you know the diet that the you know the, the people uh, during his time uh, that you know they they, they normally consume. I wouldn't get into incest. Um, in fact, because it's at an angle, it doesn't show its real size. I can't remember its real size, but it's not particularly short um, for a, a coffin. But as you know, southern Chinese at all times are slightly shorter than those who intermarry with the Mongol group who are taller. So um, you would expect in 400 BC to have relatively shorter people anyway. And we're looking at people who are living in the Yangtze area. Any idea how tall they are? No, I don't know, but if you look at the report, you'll, look, you'll find out immediately. They, I mean, the great thing about Chinese archaeology is they do measure everything. Um, I'm sorry, I haven't got it here, but they certainly will measure everybody. Um, but I think we're looking at um, five, four, five, six, but not, high, not six foot. Yes, hello. Question here, and then there's one in the back. Uh, thank you so much for your uh, very interesting presentation. I'm Ari from Bali. So uh, my question is about uh, how did uh, people find out about those archaeological sites? Is there any uh, special tools to find out about that, or any expert to locate? all those you know, important uh, tombs that you mentioned in your presentation. Thank you. Well, that, the, the text I showed you from the Han Dynasty comes out of the tomb. So in the Han Dynasty, there's quite, a, in, particularly in southern China, they bury, well, in all of China, they probably bury text, but in southern China, which is more humid, the texts tend to be better preserved. So that text was on a wooden slab or a you know, wooden plaque and is written down and the, it's a translation. And I wrote on the top of the PPT the, the article from which I'd taken it. So there's a, there are long articles about these texts. <coughs> the Shang Dynasty, which I showed first, which is 200, 1200 BC, is part of a large excavation that has taken place since the 1920, late 1920s to today. So that, um, and that is supported by oracle bones, that in that site at Anyang, they found archives of oracle bones, which list the names of the kings, and that agrees with approximately Sima Qian's list of the Shang kings. So we have at various points um, correlation, if you like, between texts and, and tombs. So when we get to the Western Zhou, the successors to the Shang, we have long inscriptions, and then we have some much later texts, and we can also correlate, more or less, the bronzes with the texts, and then we can also date the bronzes and the tombs. So, and by the time we get to the Han, we're into very concrete texts and tombs. So the I don't think the dating of the tombs is that questionable. Um, it may be difficult about a particular tomb. We may not be absolutely sure that we've got the right place. But I think in general brackets, we know the dates of the tombs. And this goes on right through the later period from the um, Sui, Tang, Song, and so on. Um, but as we reach the Song, we are much less interested in tombs. They have become less important. They still exist. They're still large cemeteries, but the contents are less elaborate. And it's really only the Ming and the Qing tombs and their princes, the imperial princes, that provide us with the kind of luxury you see at the earlier period. But they don't stop. I mean, there's some very interesting 
um, Ming princes in Hubei and Hunan, all of whom have quite elaborate tombs. So, and, and then we get in these tombs also collections of texts and collections of rubbings. So it depends on the preservation how much material we get with the tomb. But what I'm in a way arguing for is that we should recognize that we're looking at tombs. We're not looking at objects in a museum. We, we are seeing complete groups that belong to an individual or to his family, her family, and we should not pull it apart too much. We should try and see it holistically. In the back, yes. Uh, in two, the back, yeah. Two of them. Uh, there's two, but first, she had asked earlier. Lady at the back. The lady, yes. Oh, hi. I was wondering whether you can talk about uh, the practice of human sacrifice. Uh, is it something that's sort of original to the Shang Dynasty, or was that introduced um, from interactions with the Northern Steppes? Um, and also... What is introduced? What are you asking about? A human sacrifice. Human sacrifice. Human sacrifice. Well, I think you should be quite careful. There are two kinds of burial, and one is a sacrifice, one is an attendant, and the Shang, so we, the Chinese often call them sacrifices, but I wouldn't call them all sacrifices because you're not getting the picture. The Shang dynasty actually have real sacrifices, often on the ramps with the person beheaded, but they will have a complete body, often with an accompanying dog, as an attendant in a tomb. So that there are two different categories. Um, the sacrifices die away. And attendants come and go. There are a lot of attendants in the Shang, very few in the Western Zhou. And then I think that the attendants are reintroduced in the Eastern Zhou, perhaps by contact with the steppe. But they're not, at no time is the steppe directly interacting with China. It's in, there are sort of intermediaries. But um, because in the in the Chinese text, they call it a sacrifice in the, in the report. Um, I think it's very important to try and separate what is an attendant from what is a sacrifice. And real sacrifices later than the Shang, often in separate pits. They're not in the tomb. I mean, I think the main Chinese are pretty careful. They know what they should have in a tomb, and it should not be animals and it should not be sacrificed individuals. It will be attendants and possessions. So um, just like the Chinese today and in the past and all of us around the world have rituals and customs, I think the ancient Chinese did too. Well, thank you so much. Uh, the, young, the young man here. Uh, Thank you, Professor, for your amazing presentation. So I have a question, it's about the tomb. Uh, you said the tomb reflect the Chinese culture, but as we all know, but I think Asian people also know that Chinese tomb have always been looted and destroyed at some point of life. But why the Chinese people keep burying their treasures into the tomb, even they knew that at some point of, at some point of the history, the tomb would be destroyed by the looters. And for the past 2,000 years, this trend just keep, to keep happening until the end of the Qing Dynasty. Of course, nowadays, if I die, I, I'm not <laughs> burying anything to the tomb, right? I will give to my children. But why this tradition keep happening in the ancient Chinese China? Thank you. Well, they aren't all looted because we wouldn't have the complicated examples I've shown you. They're not all looted. Um, what actually happens is that as these very elaborate burials are made, they're often accompanied by people who are, whose duty it is to make offerings, to the, make it providing food and drink, maybe daily even, but certainly weekly or in seasonal. So I think everybody thinks their tomb is going to be guarded by the people looking after the tomb for, for ritual purposes. And then, what happens is that that group of people are ousted or pushed away by incomers. I mean, China is full of, you know, we're looking at a very long period, and if you were to go to Europe, you would find in that same long period, a huge number of governments change, powerful nobles change, 
And so we're all optimists. We all think that what we set up today will be here tomorrow. But what you're right, that there is in fact a large degree of change and the Zhou dynasty definitely deliberately looted the tombs of the Shang to prevent the Shang kings who were in their tombs influencing their government. So the Zhou showed that they were just as set up as the Shang in believing that the afterlife was an important source of power. And I'm I think this goes right down to the 20th century with people being concerned with the ghosts, with spirits, with other deities. I mean, I haven't mentioned all the other millions of other deities that are around in the China mythology or China's view of the cosmos. So that um, it's a very elaborate world, China, especially for me as a foreigner, and I'm never sure I've got it right. But um, I. I think what I'm relying on, or think that people were relying on, is that they had people next to the tomb looking after the tomb. And they didn't anticipate that they'd be, that they'd be knocked out by the late next invasion or the next dynasty. I mean, that's also true, for instance, we've just changed government in Britain, but the conservatives thought they would be there forever. You know, so, I mean, people have a, over-optimistic. <laughs> Let's see, another question, uh, yeah. blue shirt, uh, yeah. This gentleman. Um, thanks for the great talk. Uh, in the tomb of Marcus Eofzen in Hubei, he showed us um, his grand tent with sophisticated brown structure. Um, looks like there was a, a rising interest in outdoor leisure in Eastern Zhou period. I wonder if you could talk a little it bit was... more about a wider interest in what? Uh, outdoor leisure, like outdoor activities, because the tents, to me, shows that uh, they were more interested in... I don't know, I didn't get the word. Know. Sorry, outdoor leisure. Right, remember the tent you showed us? Looks like there was rising interest in outdoor activities. Another I'm confused about the word. Outdoor, indoor, oh, outdoor. outdoor, outdoor. Um, yes, I think we must think that there was a lot more outdoor life than we know about. Um, I mean, the man with the gold belt must have had a lot of communication with people who could provide the gold. So I think the Marquis, um, the number of tents is quite limited in excavation, but there are at least half a dozen that have been found. Earlier ones look as if they come from contact with the ten people, the northerners, and this one is so large, it's huge. Um, it looks like almost for giving banquets in the open air, but he, you know his tomb has boxes with sets of cups in it and things for traveling. So I suspect in life he hoped or did travel, and that this tent or things like it were intended to make that traveling easier or more comfortable. The, the tent is extremely complicated. You've probably seen the report. And um, it's, I mean, it's all more complicated than it need to be, in fact. I mean, the fixings are incredibly complicated. So um, what intrigues me is that the people there had certain kinds of engineering skills or engineering interests. I'm going to, I must take a drink of water. I'm losing my voice. So, so you think that it's interesting that they have this outdoor interest. I, 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 well, it doesn't surprise me. I think they should do, because hunting, um, fighting, all that's very outdoor. Uh, let's see, there's two of you. Here's one here. Or over here, yeah, she had her hand. Oh, you have a mic. <laughs> thank you, thank you. Uh, thank you for your illuminating talk. Um, in your previous study, you have well studied the power of images in Chinese uh, belief system. So um, you suggested images, uh, figuring, tomb figurings of were functioned as actual person yes. or um, the actual objects they represented. So apart from the visual representation, I'm extremely interested in funeral test and also different writings, different types of writings in Chinese tombs. So I wonder, could you talk about 
more um, to, uh, talk about more about the agency well, of writing. Some are readable, some are yes, unreadable. Yes, um, the, the power of writing. I think this is something that for the Chinese, honestly, um, a foreigner like me is not good enough. But I do think your writing is particularly strong because each character is immediately recognizable as you walk down the street. So um, from quite early times, um, you're using that force. Um, and I think it's extraordinary that there are these bureaucratic documents in Han Dynasty tombs. Um, I think that has an agency that the person who buried it really did think there was a set of bureaucrats who are not even included in the tomb figures. They are known about through people talking about it. And there's a, a quite a lot of, I mean, articles that I've read indicating that um, this group of bureaucrats existed, if you like. And, and what I'm really suggesting is the image and the writing has agency not on the real world, but on the world of the afterlife. And so, and also I'm suggesting that both the life and afterlife, if you like, coexist and overlap, and the image or the graph, the writing, um, is both, um, has agency in life and agency in the afterlife. I mean, that, the, that this is something, it's almost hard mind bending to think about, but um, I don't, I think the terracotta warriors are the key place to start. And um, in fact, he, the first emperor is very big on writing and giving statements to make claims as, I mean, one of the interesting things is all politicians use words to make claims about things that don't exist. So for instance, in Britain, we have enormous problems with the channel through Brexit. We can't control people who come in rubber boats. So we have all governments saying we're controlling the immigrants. Well, they're not, but they're trying to get the message across that if they could, they would. So um, I think words have a special agency that is different from the image agency. Um, but in, in the West, I mean, in China, the image has an extraordinary strong agency. And I'm always impressed that, unlike the West, um, if you go into a restaurant, you'll find peonies or daffodils or dragons, and they are functioning today as they would have done 200 years ago. So um, I think the agency of images and the agency of graphs is much stronger in, the, in China than in the West, um, because we would have thought and people would have believed in using icons of the Virgin as, uh, as the Virgin being present in the room, but that's much less strong than it was. Maybe uh, sort of the last question, I think we, we have the call of prayer. One thing. I can hear that, yes. And, and, uh, and then it's also been, it's new. Uh, okay, uh, thank you very much for your, for your speech. Uh, I, so I was uh, born in Tianxi, uh, gun supervised in China. So I uh, did my master's degree in, in the Mongolian University. So uh, I'm very excited to see something unfamiliar. So uh, with interviews for I, I, the you're different not clear, You're running uh, too fast and not clear uh, enough. Okay, okay. So uh, also is uh, not my question, but uh, my studio friends, they are uh, listening to the, uh, on the line uh, in, in China. So uh, they would like to ask for some uh, ones, uh, for you uh, thoughts about the patterns on the brothers. Uh, thank you. I haven't understood a word you said. Uh, so, uh, uh, so, 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 uh, so they want to say, uh, uh, they want to listen to your uh, thoughts about the patterns on the brothers. Uh, uh, in so he, he's asking the meaning about of patterns on bronzes. The patterns on the bronze vessels. Patterns on the bronze vessels. Yeah. Um, I'm not going to say anything about patterns on the bronze vessels because um, there are a lot of fights about that or arguments. And I think it's, um, I don't think there's any single answer. At this minute, 
nobody has probably worked out how the casting was done. It's another story to do with the Loess. You could not have made these bronze vessels in the Shang without the very fine sandy clay, if you like, of the Huangtu. So the question is, how did they make that, and what are they stimulated to make it in such a complicated way? It's an extremely complicated technique. Um, I would say that in some degree, the patterns are quite simple, and then they're made complicated by the technique. So um, I think until, we, until I'm convinced someone knows how the technique worked, I mean, I have, I've attended some very interesting talks in China recently about it, and I think I do think we now know what the technique was in outline, but we don't know for each vessel how it's done. And there are different people trying to put forward different ways to interpret the design, and I'm going to leave that to other people. It's not so far helped anybody. Um, so far, it's just led to argument, and it's not clear. I mean, when I first studied China and Chinese bronzes, no one ever talked about the afterlife. No one talked about sets. These bronzes come in sets. No one talked about the way in which the early bronzes are then buried in much later tombs because the Zhou looted the Shang tombs. You know, there's so many different things that happened to these bronzes that I would be, um, I would say that what the designs mean or how they mean or what they represent is outside certainly my ability and probably outside everybody's ability at present. But I can promise you a man called Rod Campbell is about to publish a book on this subject. So maybe that's the person to go and read about, but it's quite complicated. But he doesn't mention the technique of casting either. So casting is very, very complicated. If you meet, the only book that really begins to talk about it is Li Yong Di's book on Anyang. And um, there are various PhD theses and articles by Chinese scholars that explain the complexity of the casting system. Sir, can I follow up with one small question? Yes. Uh, thank you. Thank you for a fascinating uh, presentation. Uh, could, you, could you move your, away from your mouth? Oh, but I wonder sorry. if it's clearer. There's a lot of um, noise. Um, so I'm just wondering, because you mentioned, you know, after the Han Dynasty, there are like less elaborate tombs of such scales. I mean, there's still, you know, tombs of for lots of tombs, you know, arist less, um, lots aristocrats of and you know, emperors. But um, you know, um, in general, there are less. So I'm just wondering if you think that has something to do with sort of ideological shift which happened with the Han Dynasty, you know, with the rise of this sort of imperially sanctioned Confucianism, and there was more sort of influence of, um, you know, the Buddhism after Han, and but there was also, you know, impact of the Taoism, you know, for example, associated with the Lady Dai's tomb, you know. Um, so I think just, um, do you think that sort of the change of the tomb has something to do with this kind of ideological shift? Thank you. I think you're right. I think there's certainly, if I was going to show you the whole period, you'd have to factor that in. I think Buddhism was a big sh shock to the Chinese system because it showed them there was another world, another, another culture, and a very strong position. And, but Buddhism was then modified to include many features of this concern for your parents, and so on. Um, what I do think is that you don't, we don't have the same dramatic picture of Sung tombs because they haven't excavated the high-ranking tombs. We do have very good picture of the Liao tombs and some Jin tombs. So that there are tombs, and, but um, I think, as you know, as you can see, I've been particularly interested in certain features. One of them is built, digging them in this lowest land the, the Liao tombs actually imitate the Tang. So another question is, how did people learn how to make tombs? And clearly you weren't meant to know about other people's tombs, but clearly people learned. So the Liao have learned from the Tang, and the Jin to some extent from the Sung. So that um, 
there is a kind of transmission going on, and there are quite elaborate tombs in all these periods, but they are not mainly not major elites. The Liao and the Jin have some very big tombs have been excavated, but um, it's not well. I haven't got enough time in my life to do every period, if you like. And what I'm really telling you is that I'm, my book is the only book which shows tombs over a period of time. There are many books that look at tombs in a set period and discuss the relationship to the society of the Jin or the society of the Han. There are a lot of books on Han tombs, but they don't show you the connections from the Shang or the late Neolithic down to the Qing. So what I'm trying to indicate is this is a tradition that has been ignored as a tradition. It's not ignored individually. And people look at medieval tombs in the West or at the, at the pyramids, but I think they should also look at this as one of the main sources of information about Chinese society, and a very important one. I think you, I think with this last statement, it's a, uh, very concluding really what you've been trying to do and how, uh, uh, versus uh, the more, you know, the pre previous work focused just on tombs and so on. So I, I think you have, uh, in a way, summarized some of what you were doing. Uh, and and it, we've been at it now for an hour and a half, I think, so that I think we could all thank Professor Rawson and the common Thank you very much, and I'm sure that she, if you want to come up and talk, or she'll come down. I think we'll come down. Thank you, Professor Stephen. And please give a big round of applause to moderator and also speaker. Thank you so very much. Please stay on stage as Ugi Emily representatives will present a token to Professor Stephen and Professor Jessica. And we kindly invite Secretary Directorate for Research of Universitas Gajah Mada, Professor Diatrina Rirati. Professor Trina, please move forward. Oh. Thank you so very much, Professor Jessica Rosen, for your valuable contribution as speaker to this special session, Tang Prize Lecture of AAS in Asia Conference 2024. And also, we thanks to our moderator, Professor Stephen McKinnon. And after the token session, we would like to invite Prof. Trina and the speaker and also the moderator to have photos together. Yeah. Please move on the floor. Move forward on the floor. Okay, we would like to ask uh, the, the speaker and also Prof. Trina to facing the backdrop uh, as we will have some photo with the audience maybe the first session please give your best smile and the next session please facing the backdrop the background yeah and all audience are kindly please raise you may move forward also miss five steps ahead. Yes, right. Okay. All of you, all participants, you may move forward and join the photo session. One, two, three. Please give your thumb together, all of you, to the camera. Give your thumb. Okay, good. All right, thank you so very much, ladies and gentlemen. We have come to the end of our special session.
Kang Price Lecture of AAS in Asia Conference 2024. Thank you for your attendance and active participation. And we do hope you get a fruitful insight. Now it's lunch time. Please feel free to enjoy food and drinks. We specially provided to you at Grasaba Pramana UGM at the second floor. You may enjoy.